Welcome to This Week in Kansas with your host, Tim Brown. Hello and welcome to This Week in Kansas. Thank you for being with us this morning. Education and money are always a huge topic of interest in Kansas. Lawmakers have a big task ahead in the coming session, particularly with the expected outcome of Gannon versus Kansas. And will the Supreme Court uphold the lower court's decision? If so, the decision comes with a big price tag. Proponents of Medicaid expansion are gearing up for another attempt to get lawmakers behind the effort in Kansas. Do they have a chance? We have a lot to talk about this morning, so let's get right to education. We'll talk a little bit about, you know, we do have Gannon coming up, or the, the Supreme Court decision, which will, I think most observers would say that it's likely that the Supreme Court will uphold the lower court, and if that does happen, that's going to be a huge challenge for lawmakers. Jim, I'm going to start with you since you are a lawmaker and you are staring down uh, that barrel as uh, you get ready for the session. That could be pretty tough. Oh, no, it's a huge. It's it, it will dominate the session if the court hands down a ruling. To remind folks, there was a lawsuit based on an earlier lawsuit, which was based on an earlier lawsuit that basically alleges that the legislature has violated their constitutional duty to provide for an adequate or sufficient education. Um, the lower court ruled in favor of the plaintiff saying we had in about $450 million. Um, we're $100 million underwater right now. We have $100 million less than we need to meet the bills without school finance. It'll be a huge challenge. James, uh, you're with Kansas Policy Institute, and and uh, you guys talk about education quite a bit. That's one of the, 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 the big efforts that uh, you make here in the state of Kansas. I think you would probably uh, differ with uh, Jim on a lot of his stances with education. And uh, Talk to us a little bit about current state of education in, in Kansas. Where are we? Do we need this extra $400 million? I think that's kind of the rough estimate that people give that if, if Gannon is upheld. Well, first off, thanks for having me here this sure. morning. I appreciate the opportunity. And I think it's important to keep in mind that $400 million or the $100 million that Representative Ward said that we're underwater currently um, are kind of false numbers at this point because no one really knows how much money it takes to educate our kids effectively, give them all the opportunities that they need to succeed, and still be spending taxpayer money efficiently. That study has just never been done in this state, and we hope that the legislature, the governor, and the court all take this opportunity to really make sure that we focus in on how we educate our kids, that they're getting the right education that they need, but that we're also being respectful of taxpayer money as well. Mark Talman joins us from our sister station, WIBW in Topeka. And Mark, you're with the uh, Kansas Association of School Boards. And, you know, I think James made a pretty good point here, Mark. It's, it's really difficult to, to say what that magic number is. You know, we hear about an, uh, an adequate education, but, you know, I think a lot of people kind of shrug their shoulders at that and say, well, what does that mean? Well, first of all, I appreciate you uh, being here as well. Let me just make a couple of points. Um, number one, there, there have been studies which have looked at this. We can agree or disagree on how good they were or what their scope was, but the legislative post audit was specifically charged with determining what it would cost to provide a suitable education. That was the basis of the, the original decision in Montoy that is now we're kind of coming back to. You know, our association simply believes very strongly that we need to provide the funding to make sure our students get the education they need to be successful. There are a lot of different ways you can approach that, but I, I want to say right now, we think that there are a couple of warning flags out there right now. For two years in a row, our state assessment scores have declined for the first time in a decade. We've seen falling performance of our ACT scores for kids getting ready for college, and while our scores on national tests, like the National Assessment of Education, progress have stayed pretty uh, steady we're starting to lose ground with some of the leading states almost all of which spend more money than Kansas and all of which have fewer uh, low-income more at-risk kids than Kansas so funding is a big concern and our major concern is that we provide the dollars we need to be successful and it's also not just about the dollars that go into the system but it's how we make sure that every district has the resources to provide educational opportunity and that's a real challenge because of the very different circumstances our districts have in terms of their local tax resources and the students they serve you know Jim I, I think there's always a question, do we just throw more money at the, the situation? Does that, does that help? Are we seeing, you know, Mark just mentioned that we've seen test scores decline a little bit. I don't know that we ever saw them rocket up, uh, not, in, not in quite some time anyway. And, and so a lot of folks would say, well, gosh, we, the more money we throw at the problem, it doesn't seem like it 
makes right. much of a difference. Um, first of all, I really do disagree with James. And not only did we have the post audit, we had Ogden, Blick, and Myers, which were some professional third parties who looked at our education system. And it's not, we try to make it much more complicated than it is. We have we, the legislature, the State Board of Education, and the Board of Regents have applied standards. This is what we expect kids to have, four units of math, four units of English, four units of science. Well, if we only had two units of math, it would be cheaper because we wouldn't need as many math teachers. If we had less science standards, we wouldn't need as many laboratories. And so when these studies go in there, they, they go out and say, well, what does it cost to provide four units of math or four units of science or to, to address children who walk in the door with challenges that other kids don't? at risk or bilingual meaning they speak another language as their primary tongue. So we know what it cost and we have for decades not done that. Okay, and that's why we've had three lawsuits. Now in the mid 2005, 2006, we made a good faith effort to meet the court's ruling, then we had a bad economic time, and we stopped putting the money there. But now that the money's come back into the state treasury, rather than spend it on schools, we gave it in tax cuts to wealthy corporations and richer individuals. And that's really the policy choice that I think the voters will make in November. James, where do we go from here? Because I, I think when people look at our state and they want us to be competitive with other states, we need to have a good, strong education system. Uh, and, and there, there is the fear, I think, for, with a lot of folks, if we aren't spending the money and we're not keeping up with the states surrounding us, how can we attract the jobs that we need to attract? I think there's a couple of things that are important to keep in mind, and I want to quote from the legislative post-audit study that's been referenced a couple of different times. It's important to remember that these cost studies are not intended to help the leg legislature decide appropriate funding levels for K-12 public education. They aren't intended to dictate any specific funding level and shouldn't be viewed that way. So. While some of those studies have been done, they certainly didn't take into account the efficient use of taxpayer money. And we're talking about uh, bringing you know, good paying jobs back to Kansas so that way everybody uh, has the opportunity to, to provide for their family and live, their, live, live life the way that they want to. And just as important as a quality education as a, as a part of that, certainly, also lower taxes are a big part of that as well. Um, and I think um, we shouldn't be talking about the education system. We shouldn't be talking about um, just dollars and cents. For too long, we've equated our kids with, with little more than funding units. And I think we need to make sure that the conversation moves beyond simply how much money we're spending on students. Stop focusing simply on institutions and focus on individual kids as well, not this overarching umbrella of, an ins you know, of, a, of a system that, that allows individual kids to kind of get lost and fall through the cracks. What do we do then? Um, I think the important part is, is to, one, do the study. Find out what it is that it actually costs to educate kids and to make good, tax, good use of taxpayer money. And at the same time, set up a system where the money actually follows those individual children. If a kid is at risk, if he's low income, if he's bilingual, uh, what have you, make sure that those funds are following that individual child so that they're getting the interventions that they need to succeed. Mark, you want to jump in here? is specifically designed to do. That's why we have a system that is based on the idea of using weighting factors and using other devices to try to make sure that wherever kids go, they do get those, uh, they do get the resources to follow them. And unfortunately, that's threatened when we don't fund some of the mechanisms we have to make sure that there is, is equalization within the system. Um, and I, I completely agree with, with James. I think we all agree that the focus needs to be on ind individual kids. Are they succeeding? Um, we have, we're fortunate in Kansas that we have long had very good results um, and in fact we deliver those results in an efficient manner if you compare us to what, uh, what we spend compared to other states. Uh, so I think, I think there's agreement on that. But I think there's also a sense that uh, schools are also more than just um, turning out test results. Uh, there's a lot of value that schools bring to their communities and their neighbor, neighborhoods and sometimes when we talk a lot about efficiency, we lose sight of, of all of the things uh, the districts, uh, uh, that districts, that, that, that the individual school can bring to a district and community. They really are one of the most important functions in any community or any neighborhood. And of course, one of the things that we think is so important is that we, we keep a strong tie to the local community um, and, and, and let people at the local level decide the best way to use those dollars, being held accountable for the academic results that I think 
we would all agree we need to seek. Marco, I want to have you address two things that, that uh, we hear a lot about and read a lot about. One is that we're spending as much or more on our kids now than, than, than we have in the past. And the second is uh, we, we're spending the money, but it's not getting to the classrooms. Well, I'd respond to that in two ways, and of course, as you, as you know, there's many different ways to, to look at to look at numbers, and I think the fairest way to look at it is to say that spending per pupil in Kansas for basically the last four or five years has been essentially flat. Um, we're spending a little bit more per pupil than we were, uh, say, in 2009 at kind of the high water mark of funding. If you factor in inflation, we've declined over the last several years. If you go back a decade, we're up above where we were. Um, but the fact of the matter is that if you look at, at other indicators, like, for example, uh, compare us to the national average, and, and we exceed the national average on almost every academic measure, you know, the first part of the last decade, we improved a little bit toward never exceeding that. We've started falling back away from that. And the second issue is the question of getting to the classroom. And, you know, that's, a, that's an interesting term that people always throw around. But the problem is it is really very difficult to separate all the things that a school does from what we what we say is in the classroom. Uh, in Kansas, the overwhelming amount of money and uh, uh, and personnel are teachers and other instructional people like class, classroom aides, paraprofessionals. But everything else that's part of a school system has an impact on what happens in the classroom, whether it's the transportation that gets the child there, whether it's the, the nurse's office that takes care of kids when they're, when they're uh, not feeling well, whether it's administrators that provide the evaluation and leadership, whether it's librarians or counselors. All of those people have a role, and I think it, it does a disservice to the system to simply look and, and try to count bodies and say, these people are important to the system, these people aren't. The reality is all parts of a school system ought to be working to support the goals of preparing our kids to be successful for the rest of their lives. And Jim, you were on the edge of your seat a few minutes ago. I know, I know you had a couple of points you wanted to make. Go ahead. Well, I, I think I want to pony with Mark the, to say, okay, what are we spending in the classroom? Then it becomes a definitional issue and a debate among adults. Is a librarian educational in the classroom? I think most people would say, yeah, that's part of my child's education. It's important that they understand how to access information. But if you just define it as teachers, where I know on 259, we spend about 85% of our budget on teacher salaries. Um, or you just define it as books, I think you narrow education to a point that most people don't agree with. But that's an adult debate. Really what I think, going back to what James said, at the end of the day, what happens when the child walks out at the graduation of fifth grade, graduation of middle school or high school? What are they able to do in terms of colleges and um, performance in jobs. What are employers telling us about that? And I think I agree with Mark. What happened is we were making good progress throughout the first decade of this de um, century. About four or five years ago when the economic crisis hit, we pulled back and we have not yet reinvested in schools and I think that's what Gannon's all about. But you know, the, the, the point is, or one of the points, I think everybody would like to spend more money on the kids, but what if the money's just not there? And James, I, 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 I want to get your thought on that, and, and I, I'm sure Jim will, will have a thought as well. It, but it, it is a challenge to the legislature. You know, we, this $400 million number that we've heard so many times, that's just not sitting in the bank. No, it's not, and that money has to come from somewhere. Um, are we going to crowd out other spending? You know, one of the other questions before the state is should the state expand Medicaid? Um, what are we going to do with the CAPERS unfunded liability? You know, this, this huge pension debt that's hanging out there that rewards our teachers with a secure retirement. What are we going to do with this? This money has to come somewhere. Are we going to raise taxes for it um, and increase, take more money out of the paychecks of, of the people watching this show uh, to fund this? And, and, and that, those are hard questions to make, and, or excuse me, hard questions to answer. Um, and there's, there are no simple answers. But the money has to come from somewhere. And uh, when Representative Ward mentioned earlier about uh, a tax cut that was enacted, um, this cur the current Gannon lawsuit was filed on the same on election day 2010, before any of uh, most of the current legislator legislators were even seated, let alone the governor. So before tax reform was even on the table, people were already suing the state asking for more money. They were suing taxpayers saying, give us more money. And, and that's unfortunate that, that, that we've uh, allowed it to come to that point. Uh, Jim, James mentioned a couple of things that I'm sure probably keeps you and, and many other lawmakers up at night. You know, you, you have that $400 million, you have CAPERS, you have Medicaid expansion that we've talked about. Um, 
this, there's a lot of challenges and there's just it doesn't seem like there's enough money to go around. Yep. Whenever people talk about the challenges of being in the legislature, I think of my wife who told, always reminds me after we come back from an event like that, that I asked strangers for money to get this job. I knocked on strangers' doors, so um, I enjoy the challenges. What really the policy choice was made in 2011, which is we were starting to see a recovery and revenue coming in. Now, we could have said, let's reinvest in schools. We had some temporary money, let's replace that, let's maintain our commitment, or do we give a tax cut? Huge tax cut, $4 billion over the next five years. And it targets wealthy Kansans, wealthy corporations, 191,000 people or businesses will not be participating, but their kids are still gonna show up at the front door of schools. Now, one other point, when you say, well, they're gonna pay sales tax, and that's true. The pie for our revenue which half goes K-12, 46% of that comes from income tax. So if your policy is to eliminate income tax in Kansas, two things are gonna happen generally. One is your sales tax, your property tax are gonna go up, which are the other two legs of that stool. And second thing is you're not gonna get the quality of your schools if 50% of the money you spend is on schools. It's gonna have a direct impact. That's the policy debate that really is at play here. James, are we looking at the, the quality of our education going downhill? I don't think so, uh, because, again, it's more than just simply how much money we spend. Money is always going to be an overriding factor, and it's always going to cost a lot of money. Uh, how we educate our kids is arguably the, the number one priority of, of the state, of, of the legislature. But that's only a small piece, or excuse me, it is a large piece, but it's only a piece of it. It's how we spend that money. It is making sure that more money gets into the classroom. And those definitions of that money in the classroom are defined by the Kansas Department of Education. Um, so while Representative Ward is right in that there are arguments about amongst adults, Adults, they are defined by the adult. We're not. We're not simply by, by the experts. Excuse me. We're not simply um, making arbitrary decisions of what it is that is instruction and isn't. So I don't think uh, funding is necessarily going to impact uh, in, impact quality education because it hasn't done so in the past. All right, guys. We're out of time. We've gone way way long for our segment. We need to take a commercial break. We'll be back in a couple of minutes.